Hello everyone, my name is Nigel Waters and I would like to welcome you to the University of Calgary and I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, the Pikuni and the Kainai First Nations and also the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chinookie, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And now it is my great honor and pleasure to uh, welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Esti Girati, who has one of the best jobs in the world, I think. She is the Chief Medical Officer at ESRI, which is the developer of the world's most powerful mapping GIS and analytics platform. She heads ESRI's worldwide health and human services practice and is passionate about transforming health organizations through a geographic approach. Previously, she was the Deputy Director of the Center for Health Statistics and Informatics at the uh, California Department of Public Health. There, she engaged in statewide initiatives while serving uh, in meaningful use and health information exchange, open data and interoperability. While serving as an associate professor of clinical internal medicine at the University of California, Davis, she conducted research on geographic approaches to influencing health policy and advancing community development programs. Dr. Garrity is the author of numerous health and GIS peer reviewed papers and book chapters. She's lectured extensively around the world on a broad range of topics that include social determinants of health, open data, climate change, homelessness, access to care, opioid addiction, privacy issues, and COVID uh, COVID-19 public health preparedness. She received her medical degree, master's degree in health informatics and master's degree in public health from UC Davis. She is also a board certified uh, practitioner in public health and is a GIS uh, system professional or GISP. And it is was also my honor to co-author a paper uh, with Dr. Garati uh, and on the Zika um, uh, epidemic and its, so, uh, its environmental determinants. And she also hired one of my best PhD students, David Attaway, which I'm very pleased about. So Dr. Garati, please go ahead. We're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nigel, and you're, uh, right that I do have one of the greatest jobs in the world, um, and you'll get to see some of what I get to be exposed to. It's really my pleasure to be here to talk to you about modern health GIS and how it really is such an amazing tool to support this huge range of activities. Maybe you'll be surprised um, from the science that brings us understanding to applied action that brings results and overall improves health. Now, before I continue, I do want to disclose that I work full time for a company that builds geographic information systems or GIS technology. That said, I'm not gonna share any product names in this presentation. Rather, I'll focus on the applications and the use cases to impart to you the vast potential for that transformation that I just mentioned. Now, let me start with a little bit of background. In the health sciences, we really developed, I think, a fascination with all things small. Uh, I think that probably started around 1590 with the advent of the microscope. But I will tell you that the world of the small could be kind of tricky. Uh, in the 19th century, Joseph Lister suffered ridicule because he believed in these invisible microscopic organisms that could cause infection after surgery. But eventually, he became recognized and, of course, even revered as a pioneer in early sterile techniques. And, of course, he became known as the father of antiseptic surgery. 
Now, in more recent history, Watson and Crick worked out the structure of DNA, and that discovery, among others, I think began to inspire this tremendous faith in the small to solve all of our health concerns. And I certainly would not discount the importance or the value of bench science. Um, obviously, the power of genetics is undeniable. I mean, our genes, they really shape us and they can compel certain behaviors like preferences for sweet versus savory. They can determine whether we're more likely to be a lark or a night owl. Our genes certainly do make us distinctive. But today I'm going to be making the argument that it's time to regularly lift our eyes from that microscope and think more telescopically, taking a broader view and in fact developing a more holistic story of who we really are. When it comes to our health, it's been shown that when we exclude genetics, 80% of our health outcomes are context driven. It's our physical environment and our socioeconomic conditions that influence our personal behaviors. Therefore, our communities that create those contextual circumstances have a powerful impact on our health. And while our communities can't curb our cravings, uh, they can craft our choices. And they can't change our eye color, but they can change our vision and the way we see and behave in our world. When it comes to our health and well being, it's been said that our zip code or postal code is more important than our genetic code. Because the first step for a diabetic patient being able to take their medications is actually having the transportation to go out and get them. Maybe it's not actually always the will to eat better that is scarce but rather it's access to grocery stores with fresh, wholesome selections that are out of reach for some. And while every community may not have a fancy gym, we know that the population can flourish when simple sidewalks are available. But it wouldn't be unusual for a doctor to recommend that a patient get more exercise, and yet they may not realize that this may be that patient's reality, uh, only able to walk along a major highway, putting them at risk for injury or even asthma exacerbation from automobile exhaust. Place matters in health, and that concept has, uh, is actually nothing new uh, at all. <laughs> Hippocrates, the father of medicine, noted in 460 BC that where people live and the environments around them have a significant impact on their personal health outcomes. So I think we have a really clear argument for the role of geography in health. And it really does make sense. So let's think about geography for just a moment. It is truly the science of our world. Geography provides all of the rich content of our world. So there's biological content, ecological content, sociological content, any of the ologies that are your favorites, they're there. And that content needs to be put into a context. And we do that using a common reference system that everyone knows how to speak, and that is geographic locations. And that geographic lens really helps us to more easily see and digest complexity and relationships and patterns of different sorts. I think this is part of why people really love maps, they get it. And this science brings it all together uh, within a modern GIS technology that really helps us understand and it helps us to intelligently respond to all sorts of challenges. You might think of geography as a glue that pulls us down this path from data integration to analytics that provide understanding to informed action and policies that really make a difference. Today, I hope to help you recognize that GIS technology is actually more than a map. Uh, this modern technology provides a framework and a process for tackling almost every kind of challenge that people need to address. So I really think of it as kind of like a workflow. We know that it all begins with data and measurement, which we then want to be able to visualize and analyze for a deeper level of understanding to get then to those important stages of 
planning for uh, and designing our interventions, making decisions about priority and how, when, and where to act. And then we take that action and monitor or evaluate our outcomes. So it's a whole workflow. And a modern GIS system really has tools to do all of these different things. So let's see how those tools uh, and the whole GIS system can work with some common challenges in health. So I'm gonna cover lots of examples from infectious and chronic diseases to access to care and readmissions. I have quite a lot to share with you today. So let's start with what turns out to be a very broad topic. If we just think diseases, I'll talk about infectious to chronic and then to social diseases. And to be really clear, uh, I think of social diseases as a kind of commentary on our social structures that are causing major health and well being concerns like homelessness and structural racism. Now, of course, I have to start with infectious diseases, COVID-19, and the world-famous Johns Hopkins University dashboard. Now, this single dashboard has been viewed trillions of times since the start of the pandemic, and it is the most viral map-based application in the history of the world. It was built by a graduate student, En Sheng Dong, under the guidance of Dr. Lauren Gardner at Johns Hopkins, and the contributions of this dashboard are that it really broadly demonstrated the value of geographic information systems or GIS for health applications, and it did it for a global audience. Second, the fact that the JHU team put data sharing up there as a first priority was a huge enabler for thousands of organizations so that they could visualize analyze, plan, and make better decisions in their local COVID-19 responses. And honestly, I think that's what open data is all about. And the third thing I'll mention is that the JHU dashboard, because of its regular updating, built something new, uh, expectations among all of us for real-time and near real-time data. And we've never really had that in health before. Now, after the JHU dashboard and a plethora of lookalike dashboards across the globe, the next innovation that we saw was really around human movement monitoring. Anonymized and aggregated cell phone data from organizations like Unicast, SafeGraph, and others showed how well communities were doing with social distancing behaviors, as well as looking at things like the number of visits for individual points of interest, like supermarkets and gas stations and home improvement stores. And this provided great insight into human behavior that was really useful for policymaking. Now, some jurisdictions actually took this a step further by doing individual device tracking. Nowadays, the technology even allows indoor tracking. So when you combine the indoor with the outdoor information and analytics, you could do things like detect areas of high traffic and even dwell times to understand areas of higher risk. Now this was done in places like some airports and some large businesses with spread out campuses. Uh, we also th saw things that were done like the work in the United Kingdom to analyze the width of sidewalks to assess the likelihood that people could maintain six feet of physical distancing. And some places mapped various kinds of policy information like mask wearing mandates, uh, school closures, or business reopenings. And here's a great example of spatial and temporal precision using GIS. Now, this example focuses on social distancing and weather data in California. So you're seeing over time social distancing grades where a red is an F and blue is an A. And uh, then you see the stay at home order in California on March 19th. Of course, before that, there was no social distancing. So everybody had an F. But after that, you can see that the coastal counties in California did really well, lots of, of blue. Look at San Francisco right there. Um, but the inland counties didn't do quite as well with social distancing. But then something happened in California toward the end of April. We started to see crowds gathering at the beaches. So why is that happening? Well, we can overlay or add more data to better understand this. And we chose to add temperature data from NOAA. 
And so you put that on there and you can use this uh, methodology called building voxels to create uh, temperature over time across the state where the brown orange areas are the warmer temperatures and then the blue greenish areas are cooler temperatures. So now we can make a direct visual comparison between social distancing over time and the temperature. So we're gonna focus in on San Bernardino County. Uh, that is the headquarters for my offices. And you will see that there is a very clear correlation between warmer temperatures and worsening social distancing. Although I promise it wasn't my colleagues going to the beach. Now, despite having stay at home orders, many rightly became concerned about infrastructure capacity. So models started to pop up like CHIME and uh, CDC's COVID-19 surge model. And what they did was they used social distancing data along with hospital bed utilization rates um, and infection rates to be able to model the healthcare system's capacity to care for their populations. Now, those models existed, but uh, our spatial statisticians looked at this and they started to add locations and spatial variability to these parameters so that the models could help analysts and decision makers see which regions or which exact hospitals would be more impacted, when that was likely to happen, and how long it might last. Now, we also used GIS to support contact tracing. As you know, contact tracing is a process that health departments perform to help break the transmission chains before an infected person has a chance to even spread that infection to others. And I actually became a certified contact tracer so that I could be sure that I really understood that process. So we were able to apply GIS to help health departments collect and manage their contact tracing data, do rigorous analytics and evaluate their processes. So very briefly, this uh, that you're seeing is a sample of a typical contact tracing form. And if you see the exposure information section, I kind of blew that up for you on the right. You'll see that the level of location data that's collected just isn't all that useful. Um, so we developed some apps to make gathering all kinds of uh, the survey data, the whole form, as well as fine scale location information really easy. So why does that matter? Well, when you have that data, you can do things like link analysis to develop a better understanding of the person to person connections that of course are the traditional focus of contact tracing. And then we can also use tools drawn in from graph theory that help us to look at the strength of person to person to place connections that are really so critically important in community spread of disease. And I would say that evaluation of the contact tracing process is critical because in this case, speed is of the essence. Map-based dashboards can help in identifying and mitigating any bottlenecks in the system that could slow it down and thereby impact its effectiveness. Now, a key part of contact tracing processes is also the availability of testing. You hear testing and tracing together all the time. Well, using geography to select locations for new testing sites was really a very common use case. And in fact, I would say that it paved the way for future site selection needs, like the one we have now, finding vaccination venues with a focus on equity. And so here's how a site selection model could work. You start with your population demand or in health, we would say our population need for the service you're planning to provide. Now that need could be based on any number of factors, uh, phases, risks, or vulnerabilities that you want to include. Then you add candidate sites, accessibility requirements, like maybe a 15 minute walk time or a 30 minute drive time. And then you can input operational information, like maybe you only have a budget to support 10 new sites, or you only have enough staff to support five new sites. 
Well, the model is going to take all of the information into consideration and then select the most optimal sites possible. And honestly, that's just the beginning of what can be done to support site selection for testing locations and now especially for equitable vaccine distribution sites. For example, GIS can still help us determine more precise accessibility calculations, even in those places that don't have a lot of roads or road network data. So this example comes from Uganda and we've used data sets like elevation and slope and land cover to calculate the difficulty and thus the time it would take to traverse various kinds of landscapes. And beyond planning that uh, public health departments have had to do for vaccine distribution, there's also a need for public communication. And some are using map-based mobile applications to help people determine their current eligibility for the vaccine. And then if they are eligible, they can be directly connected to a locator app, like the one that you comes from New York City, uh, and it would help them find their closest vaccination site and link to that site's scheduling system. So everything is connected. And in Panama, they uh, have an app that they call the Vaccinometer. And uh, this is public for all citizens so that they can see the national metrics on vaccine distribution for the entire country. Now it might surprise you actually that geographic information and GIS are also being used to help build vaccine confidence. So in this example, we pulled in study results from Pew Research to identify the characteristics associated with vaccine hesitancy and mapped areas of higher risk. Further, we can use data to identify areas where people fail to turn up for their second vaccine dose where that's relevant. So GIS can pull together things like demographic data uh, for these customized areas to help health departments create more resonant messages and deliver them through the most relevant channels and in the right languages. But now I want to talk a little bit more about a chronic concern, uh, although I have to say COVID feels a bit chronic at this point, but uh, I'm gonna transition to the opioid epidemic. And I know that most of the news has been focused on COVID-19, but opioid misuse is still a problem. In fact, a worsening problem in many places. So how can GIS help with that? Well, just like the Johns Hopkins University dashboard, you begin with situational awareness. Uh, this is a map of drug poisoning deaths across the United States. And here you can see areas in the blue-green color where opioid claims were higher than the national average. So these are potentially concerning areas. And then you could dive deeper if you wanted to look at physician prescribing habits as an example, uh, like in this area of Clinch County, Georgia, where 10% of prescriptions, all prescriptions were written for opioids just a few years ago. That was nearly twice the national average and it offers a target for uh, investigation and potentially intervention. And we start those interventions with community education. Mapping can be used to organize and share death and overdose data in a community. And there are even tools to help inform the community about their own unique situation, pulling in narrative and interactive maps and graphics to be able to deliver a more complex story than you could with just a single visualization. Location-based apps can connect people with resources in their community. So one is showing pain control options that are not addictive, or uh, maybe you can connect people to chemi chemical dependency treatment centers uh, when those happen to be needed. Another resource that's meant to stem the supply of opioid medications is a locator for drug drop-off locations. So this helps residents to find appropriate places to get rid of their expired and unused prescription meds so that they aren't a temptation 
or they are potential stolen, uh, potentially stolen by a family member or a visitor to the home. Um, at the same time, think about the law enforcement side. So law enforcement personnel who go and collect uh, and weigh the drugs that come from these drop boxes, they can start to get a handle on which drugs are circulating in a community and how effective each drop box actually is. Walgreens, a US-based retail pharmacy, created a national map with all of their safe disposal locations. So this is really an important intervention, reducing the supply of prescription pain relievers by encouraging people to drop off their unused or expired drugs. Uh, and it's a part of this US program that has collected more than 10 million pounds of medications, which is roughly equivalent to the weight of 22 Statues of Liberty. I know why you, you were wondering why I had those Statues of Liberty there. Um, but think about, about this in a broader sense. Doesn't this bring to mind questions about prescribing habits and why is there so much excess medication uh, and is such overprescribing happening, happening in your province? Now, GIS can be used to track naloxone usage in the field. Really quick mobile surveys can help us understand when and where naloxone is used, uh, when it's used to re reverse an overdose. Then we can look at things like the save rates to see if it was actually effective. And when you look at that information spatially, you can do several things. So you can train officers and EMTs if you find lower save rates in a particular area and you can identify spatial patterns in the naloxone deployments so that you can adjust your inventories to meet the critical needs of the population. And GIS can support citizen reporting of drug tips in a community like finding syringes in a park where kids are playing. And those kinds of reports then can be immediately uh, seen and acted on by authorities with follow-up in investigations and uh, whatever kinds of interventions they find appropriate. And of course, often I come back to dashboards. Uh, the idea of map-based dashboards can really enable decision makers with key metrics at a glance. So now with what was a rather detailed review of a GIS approach to COVID-19 and the opioid epidemic. I see this concept of a GIS workflow throughout a process. I showed you data visualized and analyzed as well as apps that helped in resource planning, community interventions and outcome evaluation. So thinking in terms of workflows, I think is a very useful uh, methodology with GIS. And this might also surprise you, but some people are even using GIS technology to humanize these massive public health challenges. So this is uh, one of my colleagues that you're seeing here. His name is Jeremiah Lindemann. And he created this app. It's a crowdsourced map that represents real people and their stories in their geographies as a way to help convey the context and relatability of their stories. Thousands of people around the globe have contributed to this map, sharing the stories and the struggles of their loved ones that were lost to opioids. It was created to build awareness and to reduce the stigma surrounding this problem. And Jeremiah created it as, uh, as a tribute to JT Lindemann, his younger brother who lost his battle with addiction in 2007. And there are literally thousands of stories of good people who are more than just statistics. So maybe this is a way that you hadn't thought of to use maps before. So homelessness. This is another big challenge that impacts the health of those experiencing homelessness, as well as the health of a community. So one of the ways that GIS can help with this is with modernizing the homeless census. So in the US, uh, this is an annual count of people experiencing homelessness that happens one night in January across the country uh, where thousands of volunteers interview homeless people to determine their status, how long they've been experiencing homelessness and learn about their needs so that services can be planned. 
So in this case, what you're seeing in the picture is the traditional way that it's always been done with a clipboard and pen. And in the black hat, you're seeing Christina and she's showing how a mobile phone can be used to quickly capture the very same information and add to that location automatically through the phone's GPS. So here's a view of what that survey form looks like. Uh, demographic information like age, gender, and ethnicity are captured, as well as the length of homelessness during the current situation and how many times the person has been on the streets in the past. And once you've completed the count, you can start to look at the data, like in this map that shows the relationship between two variables, uh, the total number of homeless people uh, using the blue color ramp and the total percentage of homelessness in a census tract using the orange color ramp. So in the dark brown areas, what you're seeing is you have both high numbers and high rates of homelessness. So you may think that this is just an academic exercise to show these two, but actually the response, the public health response to these two variables would be quite different. In those places where you have high numbers of homeless people, you would wanna allocate funds to provide needed services. In the places where you're seeing high rates of homelessness, you want to look for system level factors that may be causing increased homelessness. So those are very different. And of course, when you have both of those variables at play, then you need to balance your resources accordingly. So I want to talk about resources from a political uh, perspective for a moment. Resource allocation questions can get a bit sticky. I'm sure you uh, know that. Um, there are a number of scenarios that different administrators, leaders may value in different ways. So for example, this map is showing the places where homeless resources could be placed to improve equity. And those are the ones that you're seeing in green and I'll use green throughout a series of maps I'm gonna show you. Uh, so this is meant to be places where everyone in the community is taking their fair share of the responsibility for addressing the problem. So that's one agenda. Another alternative would be to view this through the lens of access. An administration may choose to place resources in a geographic supply versus demand kind of way so that those resources are nearest to the people who would use them. Again, the green space supports this political agenda. This map is showing where people are at risk for becoming homeless. So placing resources in those areas can help people stay in their established communities. This is actually the strategy of uh, the former mayor of New York. Yet another method used in San Francisco, California is to centralize all resources, trying to gain economies of scale for this policy agenda. And finally, uh, this strategy is using data on crimes against homeless people and high numbers of chronically homeless people uh, because together they may provide evidence of the most vulnerable uh, homeless populations. So the idea in this agenda is to focus resources in those places first to have the biggest impact on reducing costs. There are of course other options as well like locating new resources to prioritize access to transportation centers, or maybe give preference to low crime areas. Or if you're considering a housing first solution, you would wanna prioritize locations where permanent housing could be built or where existing housing could be converted into housing for the homeless. But since there are so many options, so many ways to look at this, how do you choose one and gain consensus among policymakers? Well, of course, you can overlay each of those different scenario maps to see if there are any locations that optimize multiple objectives. So I'm showing you an area that actually meets four of the different objectives I went over. And this could be a great way to bring together stakeholders with conflicting priorities so they can work together and uh, focus on multiple objectives being met. So this would encourage transparency and collaboration. And I really just think that there is so much that can be done when you use a location perspective. So the next area that I want to discuss is about calculating whether people have access to care and services and then using geospatial analytics to optimize systems to further improve accessibility. 
So let's take the example of stroke. It's a very common health concern, especially among older adults. And according to the CDC, stroke affects almost 800,000 people per year and over 140,000 victims die. Stroke accounts for one in 20 deaths in the US. And uh, I'm guessing it may be similar in Canada and it's a highly disabling and expensive healthcare problem. And access to care really couldn't be more critical than for stroke. The American Stroke Association motto really says it all. Time lost is brain lost. And the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke recommends that to prevent serious impairment or death for people who are candidates for thrombolytic or clot destroying therapy, they should be getting from door to treatment within one hour. So I'm gonna show you another series of maps that came from the Veterans Administration uh, and a study they did on access. And even though these maps are a little older, you can tell by the look of them, the study is super solid and it's one of the clearest examples of spatial decision-making that I've seen. So this first map highlights the data for one of the 21 Veterans Integrated Service Networks or VISNs and the black dots you see are the historical stroke patients over a five-year period. Then you're seeing the two primary stroke care centers that exist in this Vizen region. And they're, of course, demarcated with the white H's. Around those centers, they calculated drive times in 15-minute increments up to that magical 60-minute uh, drive time. What they found was that at baseline, their network served only 18.3% of stroke patients within that recommended door to treatment timeframe. Not so great. In their first planning scenario, they looked at assets internal to the VA system. So the VA actually has what they call limited hours stroke facilities. So they selected one of those facilities to see how many more people could be served if they upgraded it to a primary stroke care center with all the bells and whistles. So you can see that with this scenario, they essentially double access for this Vision region to 36.8%. In this next scenario, the assumption is that there may be funding to upgrade all of their limited hour stroke facilities. And when they calculated access in this situation, they found that over 45% of the stroke population would now have best practice treatment available. So huge improvement, but not, not what we want. So in the third scenario, you might hear my cat meowing. Um, uh, don't let her distract you like she is me. The VA is looking at a maximum capacity situation in which they not only upgrade all of their facilities, but they partner with non-VA stroke centers. So this would enable ideal care for 83% of their stroke patients. And the researchers concluded that because <laughs> she wants to get in the camera, uh, the researchers felt that um, being able to look at this in so many different ways, having these scenarios to uh, jointly examine access along with their budget and their organizational policies and procedures, they could really intelligently apply their resources uh, to serve the greatest number of patients. We can think of access in a number of different ways. So here's another one to consider. In this example, we want to assess the impact if a health plan's physicians who are near retirement actually retire on time. So you're seeing the providers in red and the patients that rely on them in blue. Then we can calculate the drive time and drive distance from each patient to their nearest provider. And by the way, even though these lines are straight for visualization purposes, the underlying information is based on a road network. So in red now, you're seeing where we have physicians near retirement age. So what would happen if we lost those physicians? Well, we can start to see where patients would be most impacted. And then we can build apps that would help us make decisions about which providers to recruit and how many of the impacted patients could be reached uh, by each prospective uh, provider. So in this case, you see a purple dot. It's surrounded by a purple drive time area. 
And once you have that, you can easily start to count how many of the patients that had been impacted by their physician's retirement could now be served by the newly recruited doctor. In this case, it's 197 of them. So comparing several options with this application would really help making a decision that enhances access across the entire network. Okay, so I've shown you how GIS can be used to monitor and address infectious, chronic, and social diseases, and how it can optimize access to care. So how can geography also be used to improve clinical outcomes? Well, I'm going to start with a very common problem that hospitals face, which is the readmissions problem, where a patient returns to the hospital within 30 days of their discharge for the exact same problem. It turns out this is an expensive problem and it's often preventable. So initially it was only expensive for the healthcare payer. However, nowadays, at least in the US, hospitals are being penalized for excessive readmissions um, by basically not being reimbursed for that patient's care. Now that makes everybody unhappy. And that uh, provides, I would say, a lot of motivation to solve this problem. And years ago, actually, Dr. Atul Gawande wrote an article called The Hotspotters for the New Yorker magazine. And in it, he described the work of the Camden Coalition in New Jersey and their efforts to bend that healthcare cost curve by focusing on this readmissions problem. And so their approach was unique. Rather than doing the common thing, analyzing readmissions and super utilizers uh, by their disease type, they tried something new. They looked at their most complex patients, regardless of the disease type, and they grouped them. And they performed a geographic hotspot analysis on the complex group. And so they found that many of the super utilizers lived in just a few of the area's low-income housing complexes. So they set up small primary care offices right in those buildings that improved access to the primary care for their chronic problems, but also allowed them to care for acute problems like earaches and colds, saving emergency room visits. So in the end, uh, their return on investment was pretty astonishing. They improved quality of care as well and reduced readmission costs by an average of more than 50%. Geographic information can also be leveraged to empower patients by connecting them to relevant resources. And this is a screenshot of the wellness map, which was created by Loma Linda University Health and integrated into their electronic health record system. So patients can go into the patient portal and they can do a number of things. They can interrogate the locations in blue, which is really about their own healthcare. It's their uh, doctors and appointments and locations and referrals and labs and pharmacies, urgent care centers, uh, everything related to them. In the green section, they can find nearby wellness resources like green spaces for exercise or healthy food options, but actually, my favorite part is the orange uh, section because this is where the patient will see the community resources that are relevant to their individual health concerns. It's all connected to their health record. So if the patient has diabetes, they only see resources relevant to diabetes on the map. So I think this really exemplifies personalized medicine. And in my very last example, I want to share with you, I'm gonna introduce you to Pat Dolan. He's a friend of mine and former colleague who unfortunately joined a community of ALS patients a few years ago. And he's given me permission to share his story. Uh, he's been a long time technology guru and uh, especially when it comes to applied geography. So it really wasn't too long after his diagnosis that he started thinking and applying his 25 years of experience to his own disease. He realized that from a patient perspective, he wanted to know about how to get care, how to increase his chance for a cure, and how to get support for his new uh, reality in life. And Pat would tell you that from a patient perspective, location is everything for the chronically ill. He can simply put a pin on the map for where he is. This is a fake location to preserve his privacy. Um, and you can see in the upper right-hand panel on this application, it's set to find resources within 30 miles of that point. And so a list of results are returned. In this case, there are three clinics 
uh, focusing on ALS within 30 miles. Loma Linda is the nearest one for Pat. Uh, previously, he'd been driving an hour and a half to LA. If he clicks on it, uh, he can get more information about Loma Linda, and he could even use the app to navigate there if he wants to. The app also connects to clinicaltrials.gov, and he set it up so, so that only clinical trials uh, that are currently recruiting for ALS show up. And similarly, he can explore the local support groups uh, that he could have access to. But he wasn't done yet. Uh, through all of his research, Pat happened upon an article as he was searching PubMed entitled, Using GIS for Spatial Analysis of Rectal Lesions in the Human Body, and it gave him an idea. He used the information in that article to inspire his work in occupational therapy. And I bet you thought I was going to go somewhere else with that. But uh, actually, Pat says that his left hand had been especially impacted by his disease. So he works regularly with Joyce, who you can see in the picture in occupational therapy. And to track his progress at every visit, Joyce measures Pat's hand and the various degrees to which he can flex and extend his fingers. And she logs that data in this spreadsheet. But as you can see, it's really pretty impossible to visualize that information in a meaningful way. So Pat got to thinking about how he could use 3D geographic modeling to do better. And uh, that was very much like what they did in the colon example. So he used this design application, which was created to represent geographic information in three dimensions. So what you see here is a lovely city skyline and we can zoom in to see the location of a proposed new train station. We can view it from different angles, including the various station platforms. And with this app, we can look at alternative designs. Maybe it's starting to look familiar. It is, of course, a hand. And it's actually Pat's left hand. So he took the measurements from Joyce's spreadsheet and he applied them as rules in the application, which are shown on the right. And this set of measurements are from the very beginnings of Pat's therapy in July, then August, and at the end of September. So you can see real improvement in his ability to grip. And Pat said that the difference had been enough so that he could pull up his own pants, which is not only an improvement in his independence, but an imperative preservation of a person's dignity. So this ability to visualize his progress also helped Pat stay motivated. It served as a potent reminder of the progress he'd made and it pushed him to continue therapy despite the challenges that he was facing. So I know I talk fast and I covered a lot of ground today, but when it comes to the big picture, I hope you'll remember this. Applied geography helps us to consider a person's context, that 80% of the factors that impact their health outcomes. And by taking that telescopic view, we can better achieve whole person care, personalized medicine, precision public health, and a very human approach to individual and population health. And I wanna thank you for letting me share with you today. I'll turn it back to you, Nigel. That was a truly wonderful presentation, Esty. Uh, uh, thank you so much for doing that. It was uh, uh, just overwhelming. So many ideas for us to think about. Thank you. Uh, we do have uh, some questions here, uh, and I'm going to go to the Q&A section. And uh, I'm just going, I'm not going to, I'm not sure about people being, not wanting their names to be mentioned. So I'll just read the questions. So the first question is, how would one go about learning how to utilize these models, programs to create projects like the ones for selecting the most equitable vaccine sites. And it says well, thank you. Yeah. In in this case, uh, you know, I will start to mention Esri and the resources I'm familiar with. Um, we have a website with free uh, trial uses of the software and free learning lessons. It's called learn.arcgis.com. 
and they actually are lessons focused on real world problems. So, you know, 30 minutes to two hours or four hours, you can get a free license of the software. You can try out the lesson, learn uh, and see if it might apply to something that you need to do uh, within your organization. So that's probably the best way to get started. Thank you. And of course, uh, here in Canada, we have our own Esri Canada operation as well. And, yes. and we can provide information to that. And we also have on this webinar, uh, a geography professor, Dr. Stefania Berdison, who would be a good person to talk to, and also two people from Alberta Health Services who are trained in GIS, Dr. Rizwan Shahid and Dr. Alka Patel, uh, who might also be willing to help out with some of this information. Okay, I'll go to the uh, second question, which is your comments around data sharing as a priority really resonates. My initial response is yes, we need to share everything. Open access information is incredibly valuable. However, how can that best be balanced with safeguarding our populations, particularly from bias and ensuring this knowledge is positive and engaged with appropriately? It's a great question. Um, privacy and sensitive data are always something that should be top of mind. Uh, I will mention that there are a few tools and a few ways to think about this. Uh, certainly, if you're trying to understand a phenomenon and uh, be able to provide uh, internal information for an intervention, then this isn't uh, necessarily data you need to share. You can look at the most fine scale geographic information. If you want to share data, you have uh, possibilities of aggregating data. And then there's another tool that uh, we call geomasking. So you can actually, if you need to use point data, you can uh, randomly move points in a way that preserves the geographic patterns, but anonymizes the data points. And we actually have a business partner that has created a tool called MapMask, M-A-S-Q, uh, all is one word. And uh, they also offer free trials of that software. It works like an extension to ArcGIS. And you can perform um, aggregation techniques using lat long rounding or uh, fishnets, other tessellation grids. Um, you can use political boundaries or you can geomask your points and get statistics back that tell you the level of um, of de-identification that you've achieved. And, and that's what you want to go by. You want some objective number that tells you that you have a very low risk of re-identification. Yeah, thank you, Esty. That's a really good answer to that uh, problem, which is always cropping up. Um, it certainly has in my own research. But uh, the questions are coming in thick and fast now, but here's a really interesting one. In your opinion, what is the next thing that GIS can be applied to in the field of public health and medicine? Great question. It's a fantastic question. I'll give you a near term and a, a longer term one. Um, the near term one is the next thing that we're working on inventing is uh, uh, providing um, outreach for homebound individuals for the COVID vaccine. So using all sorts of resources to manage uh, territories and optimized routing so that you can serve as many people as possible with, of course, uh, the limited staff that we all have. So there's a whole GIS approach to doing that, and that's very short term. We're working on that in the next few weeks. Uh, longer term, I would say something that is utilized by some but underutilized in a big area is uh, inspections restaurant inspections, hospital facility inspections, nursing home inspections. Um, mobile apps and tools are great for that. And we're even using artificial intelligence, like for restaurants, to predict which restaurants are more likely to fail up front. And then you can inspect those first so that you prevent foodborne illness. So I think that uh, the use of artificial intelligence uh, as well as uh, some inspection kind of work would be a next really big area to support public health. That's a really great answer to the question. Thank you. Um, and the, uh, the next question is health data. Oh, <laughs> they're coming in so that my screen is, they're it sliding <laughs> up. Yes, it moves. That's right. <laughs> health data is quite difficult to acquire. Rot 
what recommendations do you have for those of us that want to do more with health data? Yes, um, gosh, I remember my first days, uh, years as a researcher, and that was the big question, how do I even get the data? Um, I will say it's gotten so much better. So there's a lot more data available than um, maybe this uh, inquisitor thinks. Um, I would look to some sites, particularly if you're interested in the already geographic data. We have a website called the Living Atlas of the World. So uh, you could look there. There's uh, tens of thousands of data sets, not all of them health, but uh, as I say, everything relates to health. Uh, but there are a number of health data sets, uh, social vulnerability indices, uh, things like that. So that's one kind of open data portal, as well as all of ArcGIS Online. Um, but other open data portals are, are also useful. Sometimes you won't find the data set that you want. And uh, for that, I would say mobile data collection tools are making it a lot easier so that you can uh, get out there faster and create your surveys and get moving. Um, and also it makes the data translation uh, easier because you don't have to now do data entry, it's, it's automatic. Uh, and I guess the last thing I would say kind of relates to the topic of geomasking and uh, privacy considerations. If you are aware of those methods when you make a request uh, through an IRB or uh, an entity that has certain restrictions on the data, uh, you'll be better equipped to address their concerns and thereby be approved for getting those data. Someone uh, put in a comment, not a question, amazing talk. Thank you. So oh, thank I just, you. <laughs> I, yes, I thought I'd mention that. It, that then I have, oh, this, the next question does begin. Great talk, Dr. Geraghty. GIS really mirrors the classic broad street pump study from London, England in the 1850s. It seems like AI could be really applicable in the use of GIS and public health. Is AI commonly used in this type of research? You've already alluded to that, but you might want to add a a comment or two. I think that uh, AI is definitely important and, and we've really just uh, scratched the surface of what's possible. I mean, we're seeing it used in things like injury epidemiology and monitoring uh, intersections, for example, that may be dangerous and watching how um, you know, using the, the cameras to watch vehicle traffic and pedestrian traffic and try to figure out where the problems are um, and creating, you know, reports and analytics on that. So I think there is a lot of potential. I haven't personally figured out all of the use cases yet, um, but, but in some ways I think, you know, this is just an extension of the analytics that we've always done uh, is just more data and deeper analytics. So I agree, but I don't have the best answer for that one. Okay, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. Who knows where it's going, but it's, it, it's a, a really important area of research. Now this question says, you started out by mentioning the aspects of social inequality. I'm curious if you could expand on that to address the unevenness of access to technology and the corollary danger that as these spatial tools become more ubiquitous, they can re render the people who are not, uh, it says legible on the map, out of these potential health interventions. So it's a question about social inequality. Yes, and the digital divide, um, certainly uh, an important area and it became so clear, especially I think in education, uh, as people had to, obtain their education at home and maybe they didn't have broadband access, um, no good internet signal. So uh, point is well taken. Um, there are limits to what technology can fix. I think that uh, our focus has been on the things that are um, more plausible, like finding the gaps and then coming up with potential interventions. So, you know, I mean, maybe that's one role for technology is at least to figure out where those gaps are. And then maybe the interventions are more, uh, more human, low tech, uh, outreach oriented. Um, but I think technology can support that. And, and I think finding where we have the digital divide um, can help support people getting connected if they want to. 
Yeah. yeah, very important to mention that digital divide. Thank you very much. I think we've got the a warning bell here. Um, our our uh, coordinator, Liz, is somewhere in the virtual space, and I think she may be about to uh, take command again, and it, this will be at the end of our webinar. So that really was a truly wonderful presentation. I, I so much enjoyed it, and I'm sure everybody else did too. So thank you for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule in this pandemic and talking to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. much. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's our, our pleasure. Yeah.